Let's get to our AFC East individual team previews. Uh, we unfortunately will not give the same amount of time for some teams as others. But uh, regardless, I think the Jets are the most fascinating team in the AFC East outside of a team like the New England Patriots because there is, I think, a wide spectrum of results for this regular season that are possible for the New York Jets. And a lot of it rests on the shoulders of Zach Wilson. And if you look at the quarterback depth chart, we know that the New York Jets are all in on Wilson. It's not a Miami Dolphins type situation. There is no veteran to bring him along slowly. There is no veteran to potentially steal snaps from him down the stretch if he begins to struggle. This is Zach Wilson's job for better or for worse. And so far in the preseason, it looks like it's going to be for the better. Fifth highest graded quarterback in terms of passing grade. We'll talk more about that with Eric Giger uh, coming up in a couple of minutes from Pro Football Focus. Uh, but Wilson has done a really good job so far in the preseason. Has limited the turnover where he plays to exactly zero. And this is what it means for the Jets. Because if you look at New York from an offensive standpoint, there is a lot to like around Zach Wilson. If you look at their offensive line, Mekhi Becton at left tackle, rookie Elijah Vera Tucker at left guard. Becton was really solid at left tackle a season ago. A lot is expected of Vera Tucker. Morgan Moses could snatch up the right tackle spot as well, and that would give Wilson an offensive line that is well within the top half of the National Football League. So if you get an offensive line that's going to make him comfortable, that it seems the floor of this offense is going to be relatively high. Matt LaFleur, not Matt LaFleur, Mike LaFleur, his brother, uh, is the offensive coordinator and a LaFleur-led offense. It does seem to maximize what you get out of your quarterback. And you're talking about an offense that added Corey Davis, Signed in the offseason, 10th highest graded receiver by PFF standards in 2020. Jamison Crowder, steady presence at wide receiver, 59 catches, dropped just two passes last season. And then, of course, you're going to have some depth when it comes to Denzel Mims, Keelan Cole, Michael Carter, the rookie running back out of North Carolina, has a massive role, it seems like, in this offense. So there are pieces around Wilson, and there is the potential in this system for this offense to be better than what it looks like it could be on paper. And again, it all relies on that kid right there, whether or not Wilson's going to come out and be a top end of the league rookie. I say rookie, not quarterback, but just top end of the league type rookie, right? A Joe Burrow-esque type season before he got injured, obviously. If you get Justin Herbert in terms of the, the, the output at quarterback, then it's even going to be better for the New York Jets, who have a relatively manageable schedule when you look at it in the big picture, right? At the start of the year, winnable games against the Panthers and the Patriots and the Broncos. You're back home against the Titans. Titans are going to be a good team, but I still think, again, the Titans, a 9-10 to win team, yes, given the additions in the offseason as well. And you're on the road against the Falcons. Uh, you're still talking about a team that could be a game above 500 by the time you get to the bye week, just given the fact that these games are perfectly winnable. The middle part of the schedules you see right there gets a little bit more challenging, but you're still talking about a home game against the Bengals, road games against the Colts and the Texans. We'll see where the Colts are at in terms of, you know, Carson Wentz playing quarterback by that time and what that offense looks like. But again, winnable games throughout this entire thing. And when you look at this team defensively, look, Carl Lawson's a really big loss. That sucks big time for the New York Jets. But still overall, think about some of these numbers for the Jets last season. You're talking about eighth in run defense, according to DVOA and Football Outsiders, fifth fewest adjusted lines per carry uh, allowed, ranked seventh in second level yards per carry allowed. They stuffed 20% of opponent runs behind the line of scrimmage. That was the eighth highest rate. This is a front seven that is really good as well. So at the end of the day, Wilson is going to be what determines what this team is going to be. And for the NFL guide, which is out right now, I wrote up the AFC East. Took the over on the New York Jets because I think from what we've seen from Wilson and what you can potentially see for this offense and this defense, secondary is a question. This is going to be a team that I think is going to be much more competitive uh, than the market is giving it credit for. So the New York Jets, I think there is some upward momentum for them. Put a bow on the New York Jets as we were discussing the AFC East today at length. And for those who are watching, Eric Eager from Pro Football Focus is going to be with us. Dive into some of the, uh, the deep-seated analytical things when it comes to the AFC East and football in general. I love what they offer in terms of statistics and analytics. But regardless, so I think this Jets team has the potential to be 6-7 win team uh, in the AFC. Again, it's dependent on Zach Wilson playing and playing at a level that is going to maximize everything around him. And I think there's a really good chance that there could be. And so when you talk about some varying win totals for the New York Jets, you get these high and low win totals uh, from BetMGM, right? You can go two and a half, shaded to the under, or should be shaded to the over minus 1,200. You can get seven to one uh, on an under, right? So you can go through all of these and you can get varying juice and you can look at different ways to attack this sort of thing. And for me, when you look at it, right, a six and a half shaded to the over at plus 130. That actually gets you in the range of what the win total is for the most part in a lot of spots. A lot of places have like six shaded to the over 
It depends on where you shop. But that six and a half mark at plus 130 to the over is something for me that would be worth playing when you look at the Jets and what you're considering from the Jets in terms of what they provide with their front seven. Yes, with the loss of Carl Lawson, which is very big for them, but still a quality and deep front seven outside of Lawson. I think the secondary does have some really big question marks, and that ultimately will hold them back from achieving some greater heights this season. Uh, but I think what we've seen from Zach Wilson, what we know about this offensive line, what we know about the skill positions, the front seven as well, this is a team that has a lot going for it. And in the offseason, I think the biggest uh, question mark for them is we get into next year is going to be attacking that secondary. But this is a team that has the look of a 6-11 and 11 type team, right? I have to make sure I get that right. Uh, a 7-10 and 10 type of team. Like this is, I think, what the Jets could potentially be here. So 6.5 uh, over plus 130 uh, out of all of those would be the one on the list for me. Now, kind of high on the Jets. Not so much for the Miami Dolphins. And there's a lot of reasons why. Right. And it's not so much to a tongue of Iloa related, although it is tongue of Iloa adjacent, I guess we could call it, because you have to talk about Tua in terms of what he's going to be as a quarterback as we move into the season. Right. If you looked at some of the numbers around Tua in terms of how he played as a quarterback last year, we know that he in 10 games posted a PFF grade of over 70 just twice. He got benched twice in favor of Ryan Fitzpatrick. If you look at that along with the play of his offensive line, it was not very good, and he himself, a little careless with the ball, 13 turnover-worthy plays and 326 dropbacks. And so there is still, obviously, a, a universe that Tua Tungavailoa comes out, and he is vastly improved from a season ago. He looks much more comfortable. There's no denying the skill positions around him, whether it's Devontae Parker, Will Fuller, Mike Gusecki. There's a lot to like. Jalen Waddell, of course, added in the draft. So from a skill position standpoint, there are things to like about the Miami Dolphins. However, when you look at the fact that they were looking to add an offensive tackle in the offseason, and I'm talking about the offseason like two weeks ago, reported by Michael Lombardi that the Dolphins were looking to add an offensive lineman. They add Matt Skura in the offseason, but by all accounts, he's found himself with the second team during camp and has not been anywhere near the level that you expect along the offensive line. And then you look – in the 10 games that Tua played last year, opposing defenses pressured him on 29.1% of his dropbacks, and it looks like that's not going to improve this season. So that's a really big deal, right? You know, as I mentioned in the guide, Tua could take a step forward as a quarterback this year. That's certainly plausible. But if this offensive line is going to allow him to get pressured on nearly a third of his dropbacks, it's going to be a really big problem. Right? It has been one of the problems when, when you take on really good front sevens. And think about some of the front sevens that he's going to face throughout the season, namely the team that they're taking on in the first week, the New England Patriots, who should be one of the better pass rushing teams in the NFL this year. And in fact, last year in terms of pressures, was a top 10 team. So when I look at this team, just look at the first two games, for example, for the Miami Dolphins. And consider the offensive line of what they have to take on. The Patriots on the road, which could be one of the better pass rushing fronts uh, in the National Football League. The Bills who can pressure and have good guys like Jerry Hughes along the front seven. Like, this is going to be one of those deals. The Bucks, of course, in week five, right? This is going to be one of those deals with this offense where this offensive line could ultimately hold back what could be some real progression for Tua. So that's part of, I think, what is going to be some regression coming for the Miami Dolphins. The other part is their defense. A defense which last year was spectacular. But defensive play, specifically turnovers, tends to vary on a year-to-year -year basis. This is a Miami Dolphins team that forced 29 turnovers a season ago. 18 interceptions, 11 fumbles recovered. That is not going to happen again. Hell, Xavier Howard had 10 of those interceptions all on his own. That some variance is probably not going to find itself back in Miami yet again. And if those turnovers don't come, now all of a sudden you're looking at a Dolphins team that – Lost Kyle Van Noy and Shaq Lawson. That's 10 sacks of their 41 from a season ago. That are looking at Andrew Van Ginkle as their highest graded pass rusher by PFF standards. Uh, are relying on Jalen Phillips, who they drafted, to be a really key pass rusher for them this coming season. You have a defensive front that last year ranked 16th in adjusted line yards per carry allowed. 19th in second level uh, yards per carry allowed. 26th in defending power situations, so we're talking about third and fourth down with less than a yard, two yards to go, and achieving a first down. They were bottom half of the league in those situations in terms of defending them. Opponents converted 71% of those situations. 
So now we have all of these signs, I think, of regression. A defense that is probably not going to turn over the ball at the same rate that it was last year. Thus, its weaknesses get a little bit more exposed. Not as strong of a pass rush as a season ago. An offensive line that might be one of the like lower half offensive lines in the National Football League. So you got all those good things to work for you a season ago. You won 10 games and you missed the, uh, you missed the postseason. I don't think the Dolphins are going to be a playoff team this year. I think this is a team that is going to, uh, I think at the most, get to nine wins, and that's going to be a peak for them in terms of what the season is going to look like. I still think that there's plenty of room for Tua Tungvaluwa to grow into a solid quarterback. I don't know personally how much I liked what I saw in terms of um, playing the quarterback position. We'll get Eric Eager's thoughts on that from a season to go too. But you see these, again, the win totals that you can attack here for the Miami Dolphins. Looking around this, I did play them at minus 140 not to make the postseason. And so you can look at some of these in terms of like an eight and a half shaded to the under or to the under at plus 115, not shaded, but at plus 115. I think this is going to be a team that I guess you can't fight for 500 anymore. That's going to float around at eight and nine, nine and eight mark this season. And it had, a lot of it has to do with that offensive line and a defense that I think is really going to start to come back down to earth after a year, which they were at the very, very peak in terms of some variance and turnovers. All right, let's get some more talks on this and with Eric Eager, who uh, we can talk about varying defensive play, all of that kind of stuff, but it ties into the Miami Dolphins and much more uh, with Eric from Pro Football Focus on the other side. Wrap this up because we talked at length about this with Eric Eager. And, you know, Patriots are the team that I am, I'm high on to a certain extent. I think as high as you can be for a team whose win total is about nine, who is a uh, slight underdog to make the postseason, who a season ago finished uh, just a game under 500 at seven and nine. But, but I think there's a lot of things to like about the New England Patriots, right? And we've touched on a little bit, whether it is John o. Smith and Hunter Henry when they're going to be healthy. Um, Pairing up with an offensive line that quietly graded as one of the best run blocking units in the National Football League a season ago. A running back tandem now in that backfield led by Damian Harris, who, for those who don't know by PFF standards, was actually the second highest graded running back behind Derrick Henry last year. Uh, Damian Harris was really good. And so now... Given all the comments coming out of Patriots camp throughout the offseason, given the trade of Sonny Michelle to the Los Angeles Rams, uh, that is going to be Damian Harris' job uh, to potentially lose, it seems. And we do have the past, right, of running backs in New England and having one or the other take the reins from a game-to-game basis. It does seem that Harris, given what he did last year, given the comments coming out of New England, that he's going to be the lead guy and that this is going to be one where we could see a really big year out of a guy like Damian Harris, which kind of, with this offense, leads you right back to where we always begin, which is the quarterback quarterback position and what kind of play you're going to get out of that position. And I do think whether it is Cam Newton, whether it is Mac Jones, you're going to get a baseline of play, especially given the weapons on this offense that is going to give you an above average offense in the national football league. Are we talking like top 10? Maybe not, but are we talking for sure within the top 15 of the national football league, especially when you account for what I think is going to be one of the better running games in the NFL? I believe so. And so now you look at this system all the way around and you, and you evaluate what else is going on with this team. Look at it from a defensive standpoint. When you look at what the Patriots have in this front seven in terms of the ability to rush the passer, right? That's what you really like, I think, a lot about this team defensively. You bring in Matthew Judon, Kyle Van Noy in the offseason. You had a team that last year had the fifth highest rate of quarterback pressures, but they were 24th, or excuse me, they were finished with 24 sacks. So they were generating pressures, they weren't cleaning them up. The additions of Judon and Van Noy are going to help that. You add those with Josh Uche and, and Chase Winovich. This is going to be, I think, one of the better pass rushing units in the National Football League. I think the biggest questions for New England, the quarterback position like we talked about, and how they defend the run. Because very quietly, that was one of the biggest issues for New England defensively. They ranked 30th or lower defensively in three of the six rushing categories that Football Outsiders tracks. Most of the Patriots' best run defenders in 2020 from a grading perspective by Pro Football Focus were either corners or safeties. So it's not really what you want when it comes to defending the run. So that has to get better this season. There is no doubt about that. But when I look at a team that is strong in the two areas that I really want a team to be strong in, which is pass rush, which is offensive line, I think this is a team that is going to win nine or 10 games and make a playoff push. And so it goes back to my futures that I have in the AFC East. They played three futures in the AFC East. Two of them are tied to the New England Patriots. I have the New England Patriots at plus 115 to make the postseason. I bet a yes on that. I think this is going to be a playoff team. I bet that as opposed to betting that win total. Because I even mentioned it in the write-up for our NFL guide, which is, well, I think this is a playoff team. Your margin for error is really low when you're talking about betting over nine and a half. Right. 
And especially when you're looking at a nine and a half shaded to the over with a price tag that tells you there's a 55.6% chance that's going to happen. Laying that kind of a price and, and having that margin for error, I, I think, is, is not great. But thinking that this is going to be a playoff team at either nine and eight and 10 or seven, I think that's a realistic opportunity here for the New England Patriots. So I think they're a playoff team. And the one future ticket I have in terms of player awards, uh, Damian Harris, two lead the league in rushing at 100 to one. That was over at William Hill. The market has adjusted, but I think Harris is going to push for that. This is going to be a really, I think, solid New England team that eventually will make that final preseason push and then or postseason push and then the Dolphins to not make the playoffs at minus 130 uh, I've laid out the case for the Dolphins as to not be a playoff team whether it's the turnovers regressing to the mean whether it's that front seven uh, really really getting beat up in terms of good rushing attacks and of course lack of a pass rush and a bad offensive line uh, by the way NFL guy go check that out so we've spent this whole time we haven't really talked at length about the Buffalo Bills. Let's get to that because uh, there are some real weaknesses with this squad, but a lot of it depends on Josh Allen, of course, um, because I've been, you know, citing what Mac Jones did against the Giants defense in practice the other day. It was 35 of 40, and by one account, this is the big deal. Bill Belichick gave him a high five after practice. So we know that Bill Belichick, very high on Mac Jones, and the extension of the hand could also mean the extension of the job is yours. So that, uh, that prop off the board over at DraftKings, we'll see if that's going to be the case. But Mac Jones, uh, really, really a lot of momentum behind him potentially taking that job for week one for the New England Patriots. With that, let's get to the favorite of this division, which is the Buffalo Bills, and the rightful favorite at that. Because if you look at the construction of the roster for all of the teams around them, if you look at the potential ceilings for each and every single one of those teams around them, there is a reason why the Bills are a $1.50, $1.60 favorite to win this division. It is about them. It is about Josh Allen, this offense, and what this team could be. But it's also about the fact that I don't think realistically you see a 12-ish win season from the other teams around them in the AFC East. And thus, why I wear my Stats Are for Losers shirt today, uh, because Josh Allen, it's actually Josh Allen riding a Buffalo, too. It's why I wear this. It's a Buffalo Bills shirt. Uh, if we remember, Josh Allen coming out of Wyoming, under 60% completion, right? A lot of questions as to why he would be the seventh overall pick. And you looked at his first two years as quarterback in the National Football League, and that is indeed the case. When you're talking about a guy who completed under 60% of his passes, who, when it comes to touchdown to interception ratio for Josh Allen, it was under two, but then you make that leap. From a 1.43 touchdown to interception ratio and a completion percentage of 56.3% in his first two years of quarterback, to 69.2% last year and a 3.7 touchdown and interception ratio in a single season. Those are some massive leaps to make as a quarterback. And I've been really strong on this, which is the biggest move in the offseason for Buffalo was not re-signing Matt Milan. It was, it was making sure that Brian Dable was going to stick around and that he did not take a job because Dable has done a great job as offensive coordinator maximizing the talents of Josh Allen and putting a system around him and a scheme around him in which he can thrive as a quarterback in the National Football League. And you saw all of that come to fruition a season ago. So Dable's still here. And the weapons really remain the same around him. I mean, there's a lot to like about what you like if, when you look at this offense, whether it's the addition of Emmanuel Sanders to this wide receiver room. Yes, we know about the issues with Cole Beasley and whether or not uh, he is going to be around frequently, right, given the drama around the wide receiver room there. Uh, but you still have two really good top-end wide receivers, and you still have an offense that has a lot of potential. But a lot of this hinges on Josh Allen. Because if Josh Allen takes the steps back toward, I'm not saying all the way back, but if he takes steps back toward the Josh Allen of the first two seasons, then the issues around this Bills team in terms of the way the roster is constructed, then those all of a sudden, they start to get a light shined on them a little bit more, right? When you have a team in Buffalo defensively that does not have an offense that is taking the pressure off of their defense, then all of a sudden, the wards start to show, right? So, for example, when you look at this front seven, they had some real problems defending the run in 2020, and there was little done to address the issue. 2020, the Bills finished 17th against the run by DVOA standards. PFF actually graded their run defense as the fifth worst unit in the National Football League. They gave up the most second-level yards per carry of any team in the NFL, 1.48. And there are no real personal changes other than Matt Milano coming back, and he's a much better pass rusher, blitzer, than he is run defender. Outside of Justin Zimmer, who was their highest-graded run defender uh, along the defensive interior, they don't have any real run stoppers up front. So I'm talking about a team in terms of their strength up front defensively against some quality rushing attacks that's going to be a problem. And we just talked about the New England Patriots, for example, a team they have to take on twice 
Well, that's a really good running game that they're going to go up against. And that's going to kind of be a problem. Hell, they almost lost a game to the New England Patriots a season ago because the Patriots controlled the line of scrimmage. And so when you talk, when you take a look at some of the teams in which they're going to take on, remember the Chiefs, we talked about that last year, Clyde Edwards Hilaire, who ran all over them in his best game of the year as a rookie. They have to go to the Chiefs, right? Early on in the year in week five. That Titans game on the road is going to be really intriguing to watch given the strength of that running attack as well. The Saints have a really quality run blocking offensive line too. So when you're talking about where this team slips up along the schedule and what the weaknesses eventually could be for the Buffalo Bills and what holds them back from a championship, I think it starts with the way that they defend the run. It also starts with their pass rushing situation because when you look at this overall, Jerry Hughes, 86.5 86.5 PFF grade as a defender, 54 pressures on 454 pass rushing snaps, but he only ended up with four and a half sacks, and there is no real other true threat for this team. If you look at it, for example, on this roster, A.J. Klein, Joe Giles Harris, they graded really highly as edge rushers a season ago, but that was over a combined 123 pass rushing snaps, which is hardly a reliable sample size. And so all of this put together, When you're talking about a run defense that is probably going to be bottom half of the league yet again this coming year, a pass rush that I don't want to say is non-existent, but doesn't have a true dominant threat outside of Jerry Hughes. And even then, if he's your most dominant edge rusher, you're talking about a guy that amassed four and a half sacks a season ago. Those are going to be some problems if this offense in any way whatsoever regresses a little to the mean here from what you saw a season ago and from what you saw from Josh Allen in the first two years. And while you evaluate their schedule, and I don't think it's impossible to see this Bills team reach 11 wins. They face the ninth easiest schedule based on forecasted win totals. Get slightly easier when you factor in, like, opponents, for example, Indianapolis. What's happening with the Colts situation? Uh, What does that offense look like with Carson Wentz? But given the fact that their front seven is arguably their biggest weakness, and you see some of these opponents in the ability to run the ball – I just think it's kind of hard to talk yourself into laying a price for this team to kind of go over that 11, 11 and a half win mark, right? And so you see, when you look at how many games will the Buffalo Bills win in the regular season, and you see the different wins and the tax that you can approach, well, I think that they should be the rightful favorite to win this division. I would agree with Eric Eager when he talked about the price maybe being a little too high, given the flaws in this roster. I think like a ten, like <clears throat> this is probably at the most an 11 win team of the Buffalo Bills. And I don't know how realistic the threat is excuse me, that they're going to win a Super Bowl. So when you look at 10 and a half under plus 145, a 10-7 season seems extreme, but I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility that that's what happens. And 10-7 and seven could win this division, right? 11, 11 wins potentially is going to be the ceiling for that team, and you're talking about 11 and a half shaded to the under to buck 45. It's not that out of this world for the dollar forty-five price tag on an under 11 and a half, especially given the fact that this was shaded to the over at the beginning of the season. So while this team should win the division, they are the rightful favorite. I do see some real flaws that I think will eventually hold them back from actually winning a Super Bowl title this season and competing in the postseason.